Welcome everybody to this 64th first meeting of the Strong Sustainable Business Model Group, the, uh, the Flourishing Business Innovators, as we're starting to call ourselves. We don't know if that will stick or not, but we're, in, we're exploring a transition to a name that has uh, fewer initial caps in it, so it might be easier to, for others to remember. Um, and we've been with 60, 61 meetings and 900 uh, remote members to the LinkedIn group now. We have a, uh, you know, something of a, of a real sizable community. We want to thank uh, Anthony, uh, uh, Ian for organizing, uh, you know, organizing the membership of the first explorers and Anthony and others for keeping things going on the LinkedIn group. Um, I have heard them before, but I just wanted to um, introduce again um, uh, Roxy, Roxanne uh, Nicolucci, who's presenting uh, uh, first for uh, about half an hour with a little time for questions on co creating shared vision of the future from her, uh, her major research project from the uh, Master Design Program Strategic for Science Innovation. Following Roxy, we have Shokish Sawal and his presenting work from this MRP, which directly employed the Flourishing Business Canvas in a hospital context, so the hospital as a uh, business for flourishing. So this will take us up to 6 o'clock, and we'll leave some time for questions from both of us. So um, without any uh, further introduction, I'd like to turn it over to, to Roxy, and I'll take any more time. So thank you. Thank you very much. Can everyone hear me okay? Great. Thank you, Peter, for the introduction and Anthony for setting us up. Thank you to our guests for tuning in. The research I'm going to be talking to you about today is called Bigger Thinking for Smaller Enterprises, Co-Creating a Shared Vision of the Future for Small and Medium Enterprises in Ontario. Now, when for the remainder of this research, I'm going to be referring to small medium enterprises as SMEs, or as Anthony likes to call them, SMEs. Um, you'll also may hear the acronym MRP. We refer to our major research project or thesis as an MRP. The definition in Canada is under 500 employees for SMEs. So I'm going to be giving you a very brief background. Please note that this presentation is extremely condensed. You can access the full document uh, through a link that we will share in the chat section at the end of the presentation. In the simplest terms, this presentation will go through the background of concepts, audience, research, question development, identify SME barriers to change, solution approach, and a my proposed solution. Now, the program that we took part in is called Master of Design and Strategic Foresight and Innovation. It is the only, pro only program in the world that combines design thinking, strategy, foresight, and innovation. Um, now, a lot of different MRPs or thesis projects uh, have focused on one of many of these areas one or a combination, but uh, something interesting about mine is that it lies at the intersection. It incorporates both change management, strategic planning, and foresight. So what is this foresight you speak of? A large amount of futures in the world of business, but also in the world we live in, are possible. Less are possible. Even less are preferable. And the smallest amount are probable. Foresight and Future Studies focuses on preparing for this array of possible futures and oftentimes, as we see in this research, making the preferable more probable. One way to do this that has always stood out to me is referred to as backcasting or reverse engineering futures. Uh, reverse engineering futures defines a desirable future and then works backwards to identify major events and decisions that generate it. I thought this was such a great way to think about things. I have been using this concept in my own life for a while, but never really before have been able to visualize it like this. So I wanted to learn more about it and see how else it could be applied. This is my research. I decided to focus on the category of SMEs because they make up 99.2% of um, 
businesses in Ontario. So as opposed to the common bottom of the pyramid conception in the business landscape, they are the body of the pyramid and they make up the majority. There's a lot of potential to be tapped in this market. The problem is that SME needs are often ignored in favor of a focus on startups and large organizations. In 2013, SMEs saw a net decrease of almost 5,000 businesses. I wanted to figure out why these SMEs are dying and help them live longer. So I went on to explore the following research question. How might reverse engineering a preferred future, also referred to as backcasting, aid small and medium enterprises within Ontario to articulate and map out long-term strategies? I have to find out how SMEs in Ontario currently articulate their strategy, if they use visioning, and if not, should they? Do SMEs in Ontario currently practice backcasting? How can the current strategic planning practices be critiqued and improved? And what insights can be gathered to inform the design of an improved practice? In order to answer these questions, I conducted semi structured interviews. I took the definition of less than 500 employees and divided it to have two in each of the four categories. I asked questions such as how they conduct strategic planning and if they had a vision of the future that they looked for. This is what I found. Overall, there was a temporary, temporary and short-term mindset. Participants plan short-term focusing on staying afloat rather than growth. They based their allocation of resources on demand. This led to a lack of resources if an order was displaced with short notice. A lack of resources, meaning incomplete work, can have a significant impact on the customer retention. Overall, they had very broad visions. A vision that was too broad was difficult to take seriously. Without specificity, members did not know what they were working towards. A lot of the visions were quantitative. They had financial ends and revenue targets. Uh, they did not resonate well with company goals. They had interpretation, mixed interpretations of the vision. Without thorough explanative detail, visions and strategies were found to be misinterpreted by different members across the company. There were inconsistent reviews, a lack of or inconsistency of reviews of the organizational vision and strategy caused increased confusion and misinterpretation of the long-term goals of the organization. And lastly, a lack of knowledge outside of an individual's role or for the organization. There was a lack of external trend analysis that had participants feeling anxious about their competitive advantage and market development. And there was a lack of knowledge and for the members to understand where their role fits in the bigger picture of the organization. Of the eight participants interviewed, seven wanted help with their strategic vision and planning, thus an opportunity. When asked how far they plan into the future, it was found that five plan one year or less into the future, two plan three years into the future, one plans five years into Future. Anyone see a problem here? They're simply not thinking big enough. That's where I came in. I wanted to help SMEs think big. The interviews led to six identified gaps in the strategic planning practices of the sample of SMEs. Now, I already outlined the gist of what these were, so I won't go through them all. Um, I then translated those gaps into solution criteria. I asked, how might we get an organization to think big collectively to promote organizational change? This led to my solution approach. I had a concentration on shared vision as integral to organizational change and team learning as integral to its implementation and ongoing growth. With this in mind, I asked, how might we get an organization to strategize according to their shared vision? This brings us back to the concept of backcasting, defining a desirable future and working backwards to identify the strategic um, actions required to attain. One of the benefits of this is that it helps organizations move in a different direction. 
you see this gray circle. This is an example of the future extrapolated using typical forecasting business speak to get to a future extrapolated from today. Using backcasting, they're able to have a future that is not a direct reflection of today, but rather a reflection of what they hope to see and aspire to for bigger things. Strategic foresight and innovation are applied to create a solution for which SMEs can change or innovate. And so, the future co-creation engagement was born. In an engagement, an external party, such as a consultant, acts in an advisory capacity in order to lead an organization or a client through a transformational change process. The length, frequency of meetings, and conversations differ depending on needs, size, culture, desired outcomes, and other factors of the organization. The outcome is a guiding vision to lead transformational change. And with that vision, actionable next steps will be laid out for participants to move forward. This is a prototype. It was meant to be tested and improved upon. So I will now provide you with a very brief overview of the process. Phase one includes the introduction. It is an initial meeting with the client. The organization is asked to identify problems and challenges. One partner within the organization is often identified to champion the change. And the client consultants collaboratively assess the situation and the problem. Phase two is a discovery process. This can take however long it is needed. It requires a thorough understanding of the organization, understanding of the different departments and their relationships, certain challenges that may not have already been identified, getting a feel for the organizational culture and its dynamics. And lastly, measures are recorded as benchmarks to be compared at the end of the process. Phase three is quote creating a vision. This requires a cross-functional group, and this phase of the process includes a tool and a facilitation guide that I have created. The activities were designed following a diverge-converge principle. The idea is to expand on possibilities and then narrow in on priorities. I developed the backcast canvas so that it can be printed large and written on. Uh, the shape is inspired by the future cone that I showed you earlier. The concept uh, and the concept is inspired by backcasting and reverse engineering. It is the result of many iterations and may require some more. Uh, on the left bottom corner, you will see attributes of today's business. On the right corner, you will see attributes of tomorrow's business. And the top little squares are for the time frame to be written in, as they may differ depending on different organizational needs. Now, I'll provide an overview of the process the team would be led through. Here's an example of the process, as shown by the fictional stakeholders of Bob's Lemonade Sand. A workshop would go something like this. Congratulations, Bob's Lemonade Sand is on the cover of Business Weekly in 2030. What does the cover look like? I would ask participants to draw the magazine cover for me. Participants will have, so in this scenario, there are three participants, um, and they would each have very different drawings of the future. But a lot of the times, there are different similarities. One may be expansion. One may be that they want to be sold in grocery stores. Um, what is most important about this process is not the outcomes, but rather the conversations that happen during it. So the comparison among these can, uh, can result in the goals that all of the stakeholders are really interested in. The goal is to align on one desirable future, and the next step is the details. Next, participants would discuss and outline desirable attributes of their future headline and discuss what the desirable future looks like. They then ask, how do we get there and brainstorm steps? The desirable future would be plotted on the canvas in the section that says tomorrow. Crucial are the conversations that happen through the process. What happens? First and why. The 
different steps would be plotted on the canvas working backwards to the front from the desired picture. In the end, the result is meaningful discussions, alignment on a long-term vision, involvement in the long-term strategy, and actionable tactics to move forward. Phase four is communication and execution. Post-workshop meeting or meetings to discuss the outputs. Communication plan is devised. Consultant follows up on the tactics outlined, reporting benchmarks as the tactics progress, and the vision can be revisited and adjusted as time passes. An optional, an optional follow-up output may be a principal version of the future that the team decides on for inspiration. Here is an example that I made. It says, the little lemonade stand that's good. Bob's juicery becomes franchise, takes the country by storm. And this could have different details depending on what the organization aligns on as a desirable future. Phase five is follow-up. Requires benchmarking results shared with the clients. Feedback and testimonials can be sought. And from the client's point of view, the consultant should be considered a friend in change. In sum, I started with the problem that SMEs were not planning far enough. Identified gaps in the processes, I developed success criteria, and created and iterated on a solution against success criteria. Finally, I am continuously iterating on the prototype, now as part of the Better My Business brand. If you're interested in giving this engagement a try, please contact me at Roxanne at BetterMind.biz. And here's more of my information for those who may be interested in chatting and learning more. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ross. I um, want to look forward for any questions. Um, I'll some questions from anyone in the room or the audience. Ross. Oh, uh, Doug, is, uh, Doug is here, and yeah, other than the three, uh, you've seen me. I know I've zoomed in the camera, but uh, <laughs> oh, 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 yeah, there is over in the yeah, yeah. right, yeah, for the. I'm trying to use it, but it's not zooming. It's all right. But the questions are for Roxy, so you don't need to see the rest of this. So we'll then we'll have your fish. So uh, oh, well, if uh, no one else is going to jump in, let me ask. That. So um, what kind of uh, questions or interest on sustainability showed up uh, either in your research or with participants in your research? Whether that um, that converge um, naturally at all, or you know, did you find ways to prompt on um, you know whether sustainability was a current issue or one of those things that keeps getting kind of pushed out into a long range future and never seems to be active? I think first of all it depends on how we're defining sustainability. I think there's a uh, miscommunication some about sustainability, being able to sustain success or sustain profit, other versions of So which one do we? Oh, well, what did you find? Yeah, um, I mean, so I'm just curious as to how that was understood or whether you probed either with respect to concepts like worship, strong sustainability, sustainability of the business, I assume, is, is at least they're in the last more than they're interested in time frames over five years and they're interested in some such uh, economic sustainability. But when they're interested in achieving a type of 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 uh, public environmental impact or social social return that that came up that were I just didn't seem to be within which we grow that was on the state of strategy. Um so with the first definition of sustainability, I found most of the small medium enterprises were not in long term and as a result of that they're mainly focused on staying afloat. So they were not they were really not thinking about sustaining for the long term. 
survival uh, is important. Yeah. Or when it comes to the other definition of sustainability, um, I think because of the short term mindset, a lot of them, again, we're not thinking about their bigger impact. They, I think they have a small business mindset as a result of their size. Uh, however, one in a medical industry, so as an example of the very broad vision, said our vision is to save lives. So they were a good example of one that does see a spot in the bigger picture, so they didn't fully understand in what capacity they could fit in that. So now, just to follow up with that, what was the kind of stage of strategy that ended up in? Research. I mean, I see this is kind of experimental for a lot of time. So the idea is like you know, those, those, those big picture concepts, is that kind of the main value that they were left with? But I assume there's plenty of work to be done to follow up with them on the strategy if possible. Uh, so would you all look at that? Yeah, yeah. I, what level were they left at when you were either with your engagement or the approaches that you used in research? Uh, most I say when I first came to them, they were level one. Oh, you have that? Uh, no, I'm, not, sure you I'm just guessing. Yeah. Um, they were not, not planning strategically very far. However, what they had been doing in most cases was working for them. They just didn't have a vision for growth. They, they were still trying to extrapolate their future from their current status. Uh, current state. Um, what else was I going to say? What did you ask? Oh, well, just kind of what was really remaining for them to, to do in terms of strategy. They either had kind of a roadmap or right. a sense of where to go They did not have a roadmap. Most were left uh, begging for more. And they were uh, both to see what the results were. And they were hoping that I could walk them through this process. So that's something I'm looking forward to doing. Um, I did have one outlier that if someone reads the document online, uh, I didn't include the details in the interest of time for this presentation, but seven out of the eight, as previously mentioned, were all for getting, getting help with their strategic vision and their long term planning. However, one was completely against it and uh, said, quote unquote, what you need to see. My question. So it, it begs the question of how do we reach what we practice and how do we really show the value of what we do and collaborative thinking, where is the space? How does one surpass the organizational barrier when the barrier is the head or the lead decision maker of the organization? These are questions I don't know the answer to, but I'm looking into it and looking for feedback. So.
then you got preferable. I can talk about. Um, I uh, what was the last thing you were saying? Uh, desirable. So what you want. So this is where your value comes uh, in. So, have you got any thoughts on how do you integrate the uh, uh, The science. In short, the answer is foresight. Uh, one of the main practices in foresight includes strength planning, and that is where the science and the... Are you hearing an echo? Yeah. Well, are you hearing an echo? I'll hear Anthony. Maybe it's just a mirror. Okay, keep going. So, one of the main practices of foresight is doing strength planning. And this looks at current trends in the environment, not fashion trends that are similar to that often scientific based. And for example, I always like to use the example if Toronto Tax we had a foresight strategist, they made a seat. So it's looking into the environment, what is going on, what is going to have an impact, how much is going to be that impact be. And I think that's why I consult so important in this process that they are the expert and they are the one that is going to do all of this research to be able to present it to the clients. This also speaks to the value of foresight scenarios because sometimes clients will have to feel fully emerged in the possible futures before they really realize the actions that need to happen. I have a Yes. Yes. I couldn't fully hear you, Anthony, but I think what you're saying is how might this be used by entrepreneurs? Is that right? Oh, yeah. Sustainable social environments, sustainability, which are often 
fairly fuzzy in terms of their understanding of the return in the business and the cost of the business that those might require at different points. So there are details, different points of measure for milestones, right? Where, where a business needs to plan, you know, if they're doing real strategic planning and you need to know what risks to take, they risk, they risk in all directions. I mean, that's a pretty big concern for a small business. But if they can take some leaps of faith and take measured risks into different social and environmental directions as well as financial, they may be able to, to show where those changes might be made if they've got this type of mapping into different uh, time frames that make sense to them. And those time frames might be different for other people. Definitely. And I think that's where B Corp certification and other different benchmarking tools come into play. Yeah, they don't, they don't have techniques like this. Is, okay, so Harvey's got is, is a question now. It showed up, so I was feeling radio. Can you see that? Sometimes in smaller companies you have you know, a couple of leaders or the founders and others in the smaller business goals in the group. Make it short, we have to switch here. Right? Talk about our transition here into you know, transition to judges. The commissioning process of any organization, considering there's a high and a hierarchy. Right. Uh, I think that's one of the reasons why the discovery process is so important in order to identify the different structure, organizational barriers, and culture that may come into play. Um, one thing that's been suggested in the past is letting the least important or the least power speak first uh, instead of having overpowered by one person. I think there are a lot of different ways to go about it, depending on the different uh, cultures that are in place. One suggestion is going through entrepreneurship tools and showing an individual within an organization the impact they can have on the organization as a whole. That is one of my main goals through this process, is to have everyone that is a part of it feel that they are truly a champion to the change. If there are a lot of different individuals that should be included, I would suggest having a few different smaller uh, workshops or meetings and then comparing them. If the results of different meetings were very different, that means a very important conversation has to happen within the organization because one end, people may be seeing the vision completely different. And uh, it's very difficult to have a successful business if the members within have a different idea of what is future. Okay, uh, Anthony, I see you're typing, but why don't we go ahead and switch to uh, Joe Tish Stockholm then. So, thank you, Roxy. Excellent. Thank you. We'll, we'll keep the, the camera in the, the laptop position. So, as a uh, as we're setting up here, uh, I'll just mention I was the advisor for Joe Tisch's MRP. 
uh, uh, hospitals and flourishing business. He worked with North York General Hospital, um, just north of Toronto, North York area. Uh, we uh, should say the hospital is a large business environment, but it's also treated as a, as a regulated institution. So it was a unique uh, opportunity, a, a first use, I believe, of the Flourishing Business Campus, not only in a, in a very large organization, but in a, in a regulated social, you know, social institution that's, you know, that, 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 that's part that doesn't actually maintain its own business model. You think about a hospital, its business model is really enforced by the regulations. Uh, in this case, in the Ontario Ministry of Health, and they and they function uh, function as a not uh, not as a not profit, but as a not for profit, a very even, you know, very low profit model that that seeks at least a level of growth to maintain some small level of growth, uh, you know, to, to maintain the utilization of the resources as they grow as they grow with the population in the area. So, uh, North York General is one of the uh, you know, larger hospitals in the, in the uh, uh, North York or in the uh, Toronto GTA region outside of the university health uh, network. So, it's not in the UHN, but it is, it's a very large multicultural, multicultural uh, um, like socioeconomic so uh, uh, population uh, in, you know, that it serves, and so the, the service areas that Joe Kish was working with and, and, uh, and adapting the Flourishing Business Campus with were, not, you know, are, we're dealing with a fairly complex you know, uh, environment served by you know, a large institution that actually doesn't have control over its business model to a great extent. They can work within the regulated environment. So how's that for kind of an introduction to the context to yes. help understand the two businesses? Okay, hello everyone. I'm really excited to be here today. I'm going to be doing a more introduction and for the So, the title of my thesis is uh, Business as Hospital Business for Flourishing, uh, Process Innovation for Inhuman and Fair Business Model. Um, so, a quick overview of what I'll be talking about today. I'm going to start with the background and rationale. Uh, research question, methods, research process, findings, and then conclusions and innovation. So, the start of the project, I studied the performance of the Canadian health care system when compared to other peer missions. Four factors have been chosen for this comparison. Health spending. Canada is one of the highest spenders in OECD countries at 10.2% of GDP. This compares to an OECD average of 8.9%. Health outcome. While it's evident that Canada is spending a lot of dollars in the public health system, but what needs to be seen is whether it is actually leading to better health outcome. The provinces and territories are left with a hard choice to invest in more on either healthcare or other determinants of healthcare such as education and homelessness. Access to healthcare. Is one aspect that matters the most to patients and their families, no matter what the outcome is. A measure of access to care that is a particular concern in Canada is wait times. In addition to wait times, OECD's measures of access to care also examine out of pocket expenditures and income inequalities in healthcare utilization. These are signals of current financial barriers to entry and needs urgent attention and protection mechanisms. Quality of health care. Canada performs well on several measures of quality of care. For example, survival rates are high after treatment of breast and colorectal cancer. The same is the case in the 30 days following a heart attack, which is better than the OECD average. However, in comparison to peer nations with high performing health care systems, Canada falls behind in terms of overall quality of care. Canada ranked 8, 7, and 10 on key indicators of quality in the 2014 Commonwealth Park rankings. Canada's overall ranking at 10 out of 11 nations is also a matter of concern. 
So what's the rationale for this project? Clinicians in a healthcare context rely heavily on evidence-based medicine. The merits of this process is that it includes data from scientific literature to address our clinicians' biases or the gaps in their knowledge to determine the best practice. However, institutions have not embraced a holistic approach to their service and business process. Reframing services in terms of value co-creation and value co-destruction would enable decision makers to creatively design business models in order to increase the impact of their service lines. In the midst of a fast changing social, political, economic, and environmental landscape, healthcare services in the developed world are finding it increasingly challenging to restructure or rethink or redesign themselves. Which brings me to my research question. How might we enhance the capacity of hospitals to develop effective clinical service models that are consistent with technology, policies, culture, and future population changes? Well, the aim was to explore clinical service lines of hospitals as business models for an organization and society culture. This project investigates and reviews ways to design a process that can help, that can represent conditions and elements of flourishing within a healthcare setting. Now, the goal of the project is to evaluate the applicability of a design artifact, the flourishing business canvas, in a hospital administrative context. These are the five key concepts that shape this project. My secondary research covers these topics with a focus on the application in healthcare, purely due to their relevance to the area of study. There were three key methods used for data collection literature review, structured and semi structured interviews, and a flourishing business canvas workshop. While doing the literature review, I look at academic papers, healthcare journals, and articles. These help me understand the Canadian healthcare system and its current problems. I also learn about concepts related to my research topic. Semi structured interviews were conducted with experts in the field of business and strategy who were aware of the business modeling process. I intended to learn from the experiences of using the tool and methods which helped me in planning the workshop. The themes covered in the interviews were around the experiences of using a flourishing business canvas and benefits and challenges for using a business modeling process in healthcare. Semi structured interviews were conducted with managers of hospital general hospital to know their organization structure and understand their planning process. These interviews cover topics such as funding patterns, challenges, economic models, and organizational culture. A flourishing business canvas was used in a workshop with managers from the mental health program at North Eastern Hospital. The workshop intended to give the participants a demonstration of using a flourishing business canvas in creating business models for their program area. The workshop helped me collect information related to their interaction with the campus. We also shed some light on their program area and their current challenges. Structured interviews with help with clinicians, directors at North Hill General Hospital to get a better understanding of the planning process in individual clinical program within the hospital. Another set of structured interviews were used to record the experiences of the managers who are from the mental health program who participated in the workshop. Clinical directors were asked about their business models, planning methods, challenges, and goals. In the pre-workshop interviews, a current challenge of the mental health program was identified, which was that the current space which housed the adult mental health outpatient unit was running out of use in a few years, and a new building to replace it would be complete anytime soon. While this was a challenge, the mental health team looked at it as an opportunity to redesign and remodel their outpatient services, and this workshop was going to help them in return to that. This workshop was facilitated with Dr. Peter Jones, who joined us remotely. Our workshop package, which contained a summary of the project, workshop plan, and overview of the process, and questions to help build the project business canvas, along with concept forms, were given to the participants. An introductory presentation was shared with them to explain the project and the process. Participants were encouraged to work with the canvas by using the posters. They would start with defining goals, then they were to ideate on value of creation to achieve these goals. After that, they had to identify stakeholders, then they went on to complete trials and move to relationships and channels, and then benefits to all. Within the group, they were to answer the questions on the handout as far as possible. From for the campus. The topic campus 
or something. There are a few observations that I had during the workshop. Participants had trouble visualizing their business movement. Some of them are not able to fit part of the canvas on their own. Some found it very difficult to understand the process and this might have been a barrier to their active participation. The Fresh Business Canvas uh, presented a perspective for looking at environment, society, and economy which was very different from what was common in here. The canvas gave their heritage a structure which they appreciated. We want to some key findings. The first was a comparison between traditional and design tools. Hospital management is more focused on economic planning process. Lean methods are used to increase efficiency. Business cases are prepared to propose new programs, products, and services. Processes are simplified to be broken apart and later reassembled using just sort of naked. I also noticed the lack of design tools in use. This figure shows the nested systems in healthcare based on ecological system and different levels of design complexity. Each of these domains differ in their strategy, interactions, and outcomes. These are distance skill requirements, research methods, design practices, collaborations, and stakeholder engagements. The Ministry of Health and Law and Care plans that the outcome was reading of the nested system. Healthcare data from every healthcare institution is taken into account. This impacts the plan of the hospital who have almost no control or say at this stage other than lobbying for changes. This affects the service design which further has an impact on the technological and infrastructure plan. The ministry's plans are always around the traditional economic model of land, labor and capital. Hence, the funding is also based on it. Interestingly, control of capital allows the ministry to restrict growth at some level. When the ministry's 2012-2013 forecast showed that health spending would be up to 70% of the provincial budget in 12 years, they looked for ways to get better value for healthcare dollars. The health system funding reform came into existence in 2012-13 and accounted for 70% of the funding provided to hospitals, with the remaining 30% based on global funding. HSFR has two components. One, hospitals and company care Access centers receive funding using the health based allocation model, HBAM, to quality based procedures. Planning within the hospital is dictated by this economic model. What is interesting is the fact that there is no special budget allocated for research and development, which is critical for any organization. Investments in research and innovation is made from the funds of the hospital needs each year. Now, there are co care models. Acute care, ambulatory, long term, and community care. North in general, on the other hand, has nine program areas. In the hospital, the environment is merged, which means the program can have multiple care environments. A patient could register in one pro program, but their journey could be to multiple care environments. The government plans for models of care, not programs, and funding is provided accordingly. But in the hospital, planning happens in each program area. This has a big impact on logistics and finances. These findings help me understand how mental health managers and not just general interacted with the design tool. These findings are based on interactions I had with the participants during the workshop period and subsequent interview. The business goals of the program are usually aligned with that of the hospital. But I understand that it has its own advantages, but I also feel it doesn't leave a lot of room for innovation, innovative ideas to start. I encourage the participants of the workshop to think of a business model which would be ideal for the program and the patients in the future, but might or might not be aligned with the vision of the hospital. This led to the creation of campus where the business model might not have been aligned with that of the hospital, but where it surely brought up a lot of problems or pain points based on the program, its staff, or its patients. When the patients started identifying different problems of the canvas based on their envision as an outpatient unit, they started finding the problems within their own program and hospital. For example, they realized the intake process for the adult outpatient unit is currently very ineffective. At present, patients are moving through a very linear process on the basis of uh, the needs of the benefit program, uh, not necessarily on the basis of the patient, of what the patient thinks. 
Now, participants believe that this has been happening for so long that their objects are process and not even change. The mental health uh, program seems to be getting a lower priority in funding, location in hospital, and patient experience. It's hard for them to convince senior leadership team about the importance of having an appropriate space for mental health patients. This might be related to the way changes are proposed to the senior leadership team. They are usually done using business cases which are often a set of slides giving information about two set areas such as needs, benefits to patients, patient outcomes, comparison with other hospitals, current literature on the subject, use of products or services, criteria for use and cost per year. While this does cover a lot of information related to proposed change, it does not allow, it doesn't show the connections or implications of these areas and decisions. We are not confused. Finding specific to the current business canvas modeling process cannot be generalized since they are very specific to non general. But it does shed some light into practices which might be common across other hospitals providing secondary care in the province. I noticed that while there was a lot of operational research in the use of business models in the hospital, very little was about design research in the same subject. Design for complex problems requires new design processes and tools which are based on shared understanding of problems and built on collaborative intelligence of people. Based on the findings and conclusion, I tried to come up with few recommendations. So I'm recommending a change in business planning process. Uh, this process is ideal for using design tools such as the fresh business canvas. This change reflects on the observations and recommendations made in the first study conducted at Montreal Academy. It is highly recommended to have a set of generic sessions with key stakeholders in an effort to get them on board and engage in the process. The steps of the process, each representing a specific session with target stakeholder groups, get more complex gradually. The process is aimed at starting a conversation and not just completing tasks. It enables the researcher to tap into the collective knowledge of the group. The first sessions are planned to engage volunteers, frontline staff, nurses, and patient representatives. Participants would not have much involvement in the business aspect. The discussion will be more about the experiences since these stakeholders will interact the most in the hospital setting. Research methods such as focus groups, world cafe, and what it's not could be used to draw out information related to the care delivery environment or service area. Use of jargon should be avoided or kept to a minimum to make the process more inclusive for people who are not familiar with healthcare, business, or design terminologies. It's important to get the bigger picture like what you said, and not start get stuck with understanding the meanings of the term. For the next stage, this data will be mapped on operation business canvas by a group of researchers who are well versed with the process. This map of canvas, along with other qualitative data gathered, will be then presented to the managers and clinicians and senior leadership team in the next stage to get their feedback. Each trial or narrative could be discussed at depth in a series of planned sessions. Design proposals can then be based on can be prepared based on these insights. So what are the pros? Well this process enables the research team to recruit participants from different stakeholder groups. They don't need an in-depth understanding of concepts related to production and sustainability. Every session will be designed for specific stakeholders, which will shorten the engagement time for each stakeholder group by limiting their participation in such sessions, which are specifically targeted for them. Each step of the process builds on knowledge that the previous, which will ensure that the ideas are more common and have a sort of foundation. Yet there are some challenges. This process requires a long commitment from a participating hospital and staff. Frontline staff, nurses, managers are often busy with day to day work, and that might discourage them from participating in the process. Hospital leadership might be reluctant to try something new if you don't see the capital projects in the traditional formats. The hospital has to find extra funds for the budget to pay for such research. So, my second recommendation is that I encourage the use of new design tools in, in research, such as games. Using new tools to enable participants to have a fresh perspective on things out of the box. Games can be employed as an exploratory research tool with the intention of generating ideas and concepts. Games present an opportunity to take frustrating challenges and turn them into fun opportunities for engagement with obstacles and overcoming them. 
Teams work in many cases because these are designed with clear challenges, set goals, and a clear understanding of how to reach each goal. Debrief sessions of some of these games ensure that the pockets of every participant is a shared one. Games help in creating the ice experience and lead to an increased level of comfort. So there is a lot to gain by using games as an exploratory research tool. Games designed specifically for healthcare planning could be used for decision makers in a hospital to quickly test out the plans in a risk-free setting. For example, Stop the Pressure is a fun and education board game for all health and social care staff, created as part of the NHS Stop the Pressure initiative to eliminate avoidable grade 2, 3, and 4 pressure ulcers. The nutrition game is an award-winning board game created to support learning for all healthcare staff around awareness and prevention of malnutrition and dehydration. In the prospectively public health challenge, players experience the dilemmas of how to pay for healthcare investments, medicine, and research. Some pros: uh, most people love games, and players can be encouraged to collaborate and share ideas with each other. Board games often facilitate the practice of existing or new skills. Fun collaboration and healthy dose of competition can make the learning more memorable. Board games present an excellent environment to try out new ideas in a risky manner. Games are already being used in healthcare. There could be partnership between game developers and healthcare partners to develop uh, development of sophisticated games for a scenario planning. Yet there are some challenges. Games might not be taken seriously by everyone. Participants might not behave in the usual manner, which could also result in untrustworthy data. A group of game facilitators will be needed. So, what to do with the data from this new process? Um, one of the outcomes of this research is uh, to identify the necessary steps for creating a business model uh, and developing a service based on the needs identified. The discussions around the ambition trials helped recognize the service delivery of training program, which was represented at the workshop. The concerns around the present moment gave an idea of their paper. This was, of course, from the perspective of the managers. I decided to take a trial and discussions around it, and I put the job to it. After a few complicated sketches, I decided to make something which is not there. It showed two possible scenarios of two patients. There were only a few changes to the experiences, uh, which completely changed the journey. This was an early creation of capturing that journey and included the base, levels of care, interactions, and areas of intervention. I soon realized that it was hard to capture all aspects of a patient journey using a traditional journey. Since the proposal was like, uh, like any other consumer service, a POSI journey map and film designed by Dr. Kutuzun specifically for soft services was used in this case. This map can be used for updating full life cycle journeys and finding the touch points. Based on that template, I came up with a map uh, which I couldn't put it there because it was too huge, but I have, I have to print out here to see. Oh, and I'm, uh, I'm giving a link to it because it's also on, uh, on the, the top post of my blog. So I can so you scroll down to get to that. Uh, okay. Link will get the two okay. uh, As you can see, uh, there are various steps of the journey marked in green dots and information related to each of the steps listed on each of the different levels. So how did I get there? The discussion around the components of the operation business canvas on the right side of this image, uh, the text is in black, help fill out the different levels of the journey on the left, where the text is in blue. So what next? Well, I'd like to talk to academics, uh, practitioners who have written about the user research method suggested for this plan. It's important to know the pros and cons of each method and to get at once understanding of its process. I've shared my findings with managers at North of General and we are waiting for their feedback. I plan to continue reading about the use of games in research, especially pay attention to games that are being used in healthcare domain. The patient journey developed in this research is more of a representation. The next step would be to use all the data collected and then create a few more maps based on patient journeys or patient types. The journey map with its pain gain points are Related to specific trials, but will not the value the participants of the workshop identified. So, revisiting my initial research question, how might we enhance the capacity of hospitals to develop effective clinical service models that are consistent with technology 
political uh, policies, culture, and future population changes? Maybe I can answer that, but what I might have answered is how might we engage and sensitize clinicians, managers, and staff in hospital to participate in a design led business model process? And I leave you with this quote from Mother Teresa. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, thank you for that. I'd like to open up for, for questions. Uh, yeah. yeah, it was related to, uh, to the workshop. So basically, Anthony was wondering in your workshop, how did you, uh, how did you connect, uh, did you work with? And yeah, I was, I was wondering if you could go back to the workshop. I was wondering if you could, uh, having participants tell stories and um, triads and, and quads. Yeah, so when I started, I, like, I, I had like a set of questions that I told them that like, let's go around this and let them have only identified that. Um, I realized that they were drawn towards storytelling on their own. I didn't even have to tell them. Like, they just started telling the stories, but they didn't know how to map it out. Um, so it worked the other way. Like, so they said, just told me stories about this and they told me stories about that, but they had a, they had a hard time finding out what are, what are the goals and what is that not really finding, like they were finding really hard to identify that. So I heard this story and I said like maybe this is a value co-creation or maybe this is a this is a goal. And then they started giving comments and this, then they started like talking about it and they said like okay yeah maybe this, maybe that and like they started getting more proactive. But most of the times they were telling me different stories, stories around like uh, recording data, stories around what patient experiences stories around um, um, their personal stories, like of their program, how they have to keep that space, and find new space and their problems with, um, with the senior leadership team. But I feel that they got a more structure because they would tell stories based on, say, allocation or challenges or like different parts of the canvas, and it was easier to capture that instead of like them just talking about different things that have no structure. Uh, so yeah, Anthony, uh, are you tuned in? Did you hear the, the answer on that? Well, I know he might be on mute for at least his phone. Oh, yeah, the campus. Yeah, yeah. You want to break up the campus. Yeah, so yeah, he's uh, now we go for your presentations to folks. Yeah. I didn't know that they were. Yeah, I, I just wanted to look at this. Um, oh, and it looks like Anthony wanted to see um, uh, the yeah, this slide. Version. This, is, this slide. Oh, is that that that? Can you hear? Can you hear me now? Oh. Can you hear me now again? Is there any other questions? Uh, I have one. Um, uh, I wanted to really point out uh, something as well that what you took away from working with uh, Flourishing Business Campus in this. Out of context, a larger, you know, larger overall enterprise with a department that has its own program, it's working in a really critical area that doesn't even really understand what the business model is yet, but they do under, but they do know how to make business cases for kind of changing the program. So one of the things that I think you had discovered was they started to see that they might be able to use something like the flourishing business canvas. To, to do a better job of pitching the business space. Yeah. And the other thing related to
we could have a uh, conversation just amongst us. Let me um, look at him. Oh, dear. Um, okay, so I just texted them and uh, oh, what's going on with Vikings? I just turned on my mic. Are you able to hear? Yes, now this? we can hear you this again. This is on a different laptop than we were previously working. Yep, we can hear you again. So we 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 lost you. Uh, I think just as test test. Can anyone hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Speakers uh, too. We can hear you. Okay, great. So, uh, Jotish is going to now answer your question, Anthony. Okay. Yeah. Be good. About please, please. addressing the six workshop observations. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Hi, Anthony. So. Well, let me see the slide. Yeah, now we can. There you are. Yeah, I, the, the new process that I am um, recommending, I think that's to make sure that people don't go through these same six problems. Um, I wouldn't say problems. I mean, they're more like observations. Some are good, like structured narratives. I think they really like that part, and they said they could use that to build their own business cases. And like the different perspectives, like, that's good. And we're just having a conversation here. I think you guys uh, missed out on that because um, it wasn't audible. Uh, so what I was saying in, is that the most of the problems was based on the jargon that we use, and also um, and like design terminologies and and things that they're not um, very um, that they're not aware of. I think, and I mean they know what they were talking about, but they were always trying to use our language. Um, so. If we were not getting into the depth of the issue, we were like getting stuck somewhere in between, like like I said, like not getting to a bigger picture. So it, it could be more simple um, um, uh, sessions where you have different people, like the right stakeholder group, um, belonging to different, like say patients or like staff or uh, clinicians and like managers. So like I said in the beginning, it could be um, different research uh, methods where we could use say a uh, world cafe or uh, even like storytelling where we just try and capture their stories and then maybe people who actually know the process like designers could then plot it on our canvas and then take it forward to the next stage to explain and like to get their feedback so it's not them filling the canvas it's us understanding what they're saying and then filling it and then taking it to them so that then they can give their feedback and have a discussion around it Hello. So you're going partly text, Dan. So he can hear you, but you're still yeah. using text. Yeah. No. See, I think that has, I think the approach from what you've learned here in this context has huge implications for how we might consult with the, the canvas that we can really need to find ways to work it into another type of engagement that, that we, we wouldn't start with the canvas in a lot of situations. So it's actually valuable to have tested it that way, so, you know, to, to let them jump in and give you good, you know, give you honest feedback about you know, how it might be integration. But the fact that they would find it valuable later, that they would, that they wanted to try to, you know, that they, they thought it would be helpful to, to use it in, in later discussions. I think one of the things we pictured was could they create construct a business case over a series of, of engagements after they learn to use the language of the flourishing business canvas, they could post them up in 
you know, in their offices or in the hall in that department and use it to, to, to tell stories about what it means. Right. And, and, then, and then the fact that you're actually able to use just, you know, triads and, um, and, and just your research around it in a mental health context to construct a service model of this depth also, I think, uh, you know, shows that you can, do, you, you can develop a lot of uh, insight just from, you know, from a, a workshop and some and interviews that are, that are focused um, around, you know, the coordination of service in the new business area. And I know a lot of this is more actually, uh, so how much of the service model, the service journey was oriented towards the uh, kind of the new, the new story, you know, the you know, working with the patient stories, working with the, the patient's perspective of communications. Is a lot of this based on kind of their own thinking? Yeah, I, what I felt is um, to fill in this, we need the new process. So um, when you look at the journey, like this is based on what the manager said. This yeah. is based on their story. But when you have actual people and actual stories, I think there's more depth to this map because, I mean, there could be different patients having different stories, like different cases. So I think it'll, it'll collectively, it will be more valuable. Mm -hmm. Like then someone saying, this is what the patient thinks, because patient might think something very different. So when you show this to your manager saying that, this is what you think the patient thinks, but this is what actually the patient thinks, and you compare, I mean, it might be very different. So. I think that's in a way, one way to do that might be to actually look at the journey as really expansive, but there might be in the new map different forms of prevention and communications that can be common, but might be different in each patient. Yes, so yeah. Anyway, Anthony we, has had some yeah. comments. He said, uh, off, he said, yes, I agree, Peter. Often we think again, this is not something we'd show to a client at the start or even at all. I think the same could be true for the SME strategy method Roxanne has developed. I think again, this could be very helpful for the consultants, perhaps not for the clients. I note we're also at 1,800 hours. Yeah. Thanos has Thanos. Thanos. Thanos, yeah. Thanos yes. has a similar model in mind. Dot dot dot. Okay. And Anthony said midnight for me. He okay. Says the, <laughs> he, he says the VSM. Uh -huh. yes. What is that? Oh, what? VSM. Oh, uh, viable. Viable, viable system uh, model. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Also, you, you know, similar to the way we might use the VSM and Stafford Beers. And um, Panos uh, works with the VSM. Okay. So, great. Did, did he have a question, or you see, he was basically saying it might be a similar process mm -hmm. to the way that you might use the Canvas and VSM approach. I think he was just adding, but it's typing. Similar in that you wouldn't show it. It would confuse clients. the client right. early on, but they might. But the thing is, when you're selling your overall kind of engagement, particularly in the hospital, I think they may be, they may be, uh, because they do work with, with, with a number of uh, evidence-based methods in, you know, the conduct of their practice, that they may be convinced that you have uh, a methodology that, you know, that, that we, kind of collectively, have a methodology that's been developed through research, that's rigorous, that's well understood, that they could learn and might provide them value. So what they probably don't want to do is spend all the time that it takes to become, you know, the, the test subjects for it every time. So I think developing a way to step a group through, um, you know, from what they work with and what they, in their language and taking them to our language and producing that value that's shared within the organization. But we need to look at kind of generalizing, you know, from, from this learning, ways that can apply to uh, consulting practices. Right. Good knowledge. Good learning. Well, so we're at six o'clock. Uh, thanks everybody for participating, and thank you, uh, Roxy and Jotish, for presenting today. Thank you for having us. So we'll this was fun. Share some of this stuff. And we'll, we'll see you next month. Um, yeah, we all like these. So, yeah. <laughs> Me too. Uh, I don't have much. So I have a, I have a digital. Talk. Have a great day. Good night, Anthony. Sweet dreams. Uh, we will see you all next month. So, so Jotish. Oh, Sylvia, Tony, nice to meet you. Um, I just guys.